and welcome back to Life Negotiations. My name is Lucine Merabi, I'm a professional negotiator and in this series I bring you other fascinating professional negotiators where we talk about everything negotiation. Now today is a very special episode because I am in Switzerland, in the middle of the Swiss Alps. You see the beautiful chalet behind me, the mountains there. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here. I just spent one week training with a legend the Advanced High Performance Leadership Program from IMD Business School, taught by the distinguished professor George Kohlreiser. Now, George is a um, former hostage negotiator. He was a clinical psychologist. He knows everything about negotiations, about difficult conversations, about leadership. And he has transformed his unique experience of decades uh, in this field into a beautiful program for leaders how to become the leaders of tomorrow, how to become leaders with more impact. So we're going to talk about negotiations, about leadership, about emotional intelligence, everything. He has written two books. He has inspired millions of people. He has given two TED Talks. It's such an honor to work alongside with him. It's such an honor to learn from him. So I wanted to share all that knowledge with you. So welcome to Life Negotiations. Come with me to this beautiful Swiss chalet where I will be interviewing the Professor George Kohlreiser. Let's go. Hello, George. So nice to be here with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy your calendar is. We just spent one week uh, training leaders and, and we've had an amazing week. For those who don't know who you are, I mean, I've seen you perform. I've been honored to work along your sides and learn from you. And I saw the massive impact you had on these leaders leaders coming from all over the world to learn how to become better leaders with your method. But for those who don't know who you are, could you please tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure. And first of all, thank you. And welcome to this beautiful chalet. We're in the Swiss mountains. What an ideal environment to look at negotiation and leadership. So I'm coming from a background of being a hostage negotiator, coming from the world of mediation. That was my goal. And I went through a long journey of conflict resolution, training, and ultimately uh, came to Europe to start teaching conflict management and then moved over to the arena of leadership because difficult conversations, conflicts are an essential part of leadership. And lo and behold, I found there were so many leaders wanting to learn, needing to learn, and I met that need. And it's amazing what you do based on how you transformed your own experiences, which weren't always easy, yeah. um, into serving others today. And a unique experience that you have is you got taken hostage yourself. Not once, not two times, not three times, but four sounds, times. That sounds pretty crazy. How huh? on earth can you be taken hostage four times? Yeah. And obviously you survived, and we're thankful for that. Yeah. Can you please share a bit about yeah. that and your key learnings. I, I don't believe it was stupidity. I was trained as a clinical psychologist in that whole process. So I entered the arena of mediation mm -hmm. with the police department of Dayton, Ohio in the Cincinnati area. And this meant going into domestic violence situations. That was the goal. <clears throat> Reduce the number of homicides. We knew most people killed, well, at least 35% were killed by family members or people they knew. So if you entered at the point police entered the situation, got them help, got them mediation for those who were interested, then you could reduce the whole homicide rate, which we managed to do. Now, you couldn't always predict who was going to have a weapon or who didn't mm -hmm. have a weapon. So the police would decide, along with my uh, agreement, that it was safe to stay and they would leave. But you never know where people are hiding a gun or a knife. Yeah. And suddenly, there you are, faced with an amygdala hijack of a fight that blows up. And so that was where two of them occurred, one in my office, one at a hospital where we had to enter. And that was the first one. That was a life-changing experience. And you didn't have guns. The only no. weapon you had was your words. My words. I, well, that was one of the major things I learned, Lucin, 
is that words do matter. They can change. And so he was, his name was Sam, and he was in a psychotic state, in a hospital emergency room, having cut the throat of Sheila, not her jugular vein, but the side. So I went in to try to talk him down because they didn't want to kick the door in. They couldn't use tear gas. Mm. And lo and behold, he entered then into my personal space unexpectedly, taking me hostage, putting that scissors to my throat. Now, what do you say to somebody? Everything I was saying was not working until I asked the right question. How do you want your children to remember you? He screamed at the top of his voice, don't talk about my children, I'll kill them too, bring them here. Now this sounds like not a good answer, which is not what you would expect or hope for. But, but at it least was, it was answered. We started the dialogue. Yeah. That became the dialogue. And we followed up from there, and within 10 minutes, the big negotiation get her out of the room, and then a half hour we reached a, a decision, he walked out collaboratively. What's interesting is when <coughs> He left, he was handcuffed. Uh, we had, I had to handcuff him in the room, he agreed to that. And uh, he asked the lieutenant, can I go back and say something to George? And they said yes, he came back, put his hands up with handcuffs now in, in, in front of him. And he said, I'm glad I didn't kill you, you're all right. Oh my God. And I said, thank That's you, amazing. Sam. And he said, no, I wanna thank you. I didn't wow. know I loved my kids so much. You see, he changed his oh. whole mindset. Words, negotiation, how to talk, how to ask questions. And I know you do that very, very well. I've seen you do that. And we want all of our listeners to understand that. And that's connected to leadership. It's the dialogue, negotiation is a central part of leadership. Absolutely, because in the business world, we have these difficult conversations all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, whether we have to fire somebody or... Even when we're facing, for example, new businesses and new areas, we can be faced with hostile situations all the time and people yeah. screaming, insulting us. How, what is it that you teach about difficult conversations that leaders can apply in business? Yeah, first thing, it's very interesting. Hostage negotiators is measured by the FBI in the US, by Interpol here in Europe, get a 95% success rate. It's amazing, not by using weapons, but by talking, influencing. And so leaders have to recognize they can't be a psychological hostage because you can be a hostage to yourself, you can be a hostage to someone else, to a situation, whatever. So the most important thing is to be able to connect, to bond, even with an enemy, mm. even with an adversary, and turn them into an ally. So that's what hostage negotiators do. They create an empathetic relationship with someone who doesn't want that. Someone who hates you or is doing despicable behavior. Or in Sam's case, he was fundamentally psychotic. Yeah. But see, it's possible by the person effect of how you are there and the words you use to influence and change. And so in difficult conversations, you have to first make that connection. Use questions. The big thing is understanding the other person. Mm. And what you have to know, which I know you know, uh, is that it's loss that motivates most decisions. I've never seen a happy person take hostages. Mm. But there are always a grievance, there's always a loss. So the biggest mistake people make in difficult conversations is they talk too much. They try to sell something. No, listen to the pain. What's the pain point? Exactly, and, and I've, I've read that you know what you're talking about when you talk about loss. You have faced many different losses, and I think one of the worst loss we can feel is the loss of a child, and you faced even that one, right? Yeah, I lost my oldest son, Douglas, in 1993, and he was in a coma for five days after being in an accident. He was studying to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. The accident happened right outside the hospital, so they got him into the trauma area as soon as they could, and uh, there was no way for him to survive. And so I learned a lot by letting go of a son, facing that pain. And I turned to a number of secure bases. People often say, and we've talked about this, how did you get through it? Well, I needed to manage my mindset, 
deal with my emotions, but turn to the secure basis. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kubler Ross is one of those secure bases. Friend, a colleague, and a trainer. And one of the things I learned from her is you have to grieve, and you have to be able to turn loss into inspiration. You wow. don't honor someone who is dying or is dead or suffering a terminal illness by being a victim. Mm -hmm. You celebrate by turning it into your life into inspiration. So that's, um, there were many other parts, but that's the core. That touches me so much. Um, I mean, obviously, you know what I'm facing yeah. with my son and, and um, Turning a loss in this case, thank God I didn't lose him yet, but I lost the idea of having a healthy child, the yeah. idea of having a son that would outlive me. Um, and that is a form of loss and it's, it's progressive, so we're facing that day by day. And I, I told myself, I am going to turn this into inspiration for others. I have to go through the pain anyway, <clears throat> so I might as well inspire others who go through that journey or other forms of loss. Yeah. And the satisfaction that that brings and the energy that that gives is just And your story of CERN is truly inspiring. Because after five days, the death of my son brought an end. You have what we call the possibility of anticipatory grief. The grief that goes on and on and on. <clears throat> and each time you think you're over the hill, yeah. there you are again. And that that's something you're going to be able to one day really help people understand. And this is so important in leadership because we have to have leaders be emotionally available. Mm. The way leadership is working today, especially after the pandemic, is they have to be able to connect by being emotionally available. So many are not. Mm. And the reason is they carry a grief. It can go back Early in their life, it can be recent, but as Warren Bennis always said, you have to understand the crucibles in your life. One of your major ones is your son who has got a fatal disease. One of them for me was the loss of my son. So though that shapes the character of the leader, but you see, we have to be able to go through it yeah. and come back to the joy of life and the joy of work. How many people are victims? and they never get over a loss. Mm. That affects their leadership, and it affects the way they negotiate because they can't talk effectively with another no, person about connect. loss. Yeah. Mm. So you're saying grief is one of the reasons why some leaders don't want to go into the emotional aspect. We still have many leaders worldwide who say emotions have nothing to do <laughs> on the workplace, or negotiators, right? Negotiators saying you have to put the emotions aside, put them in your pocket, there's no place for emotions on a negotiation table. And as you know, I'm like the opposite I know, of that. I know. Saying we we have to go we all share in. a common understanding. Yes, and it, the world is changing. But the would you say it's because they can't manage their grief or because they think emotions have no place there? I would say in a majority of cases, there was some trauma, mm -hmm. some major grief. It may not have been a death. It may have been a divorce when they were young, or it may have been a, 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 a failure that disturbed them, or the loss of identity, or who so knows. So they got blocked? And then they blocked, because mm. the brain basically doesn't want to feel pain. Yeah. But we have to train ourselves, if we're going to be a high performer, to engage in pain. Engage in pain, yeah. to be able to go through it, to learn from it. That's resilience. And you are a model of resilience. And we have to understand that Yes, there are many leaders who are blocked and they, they do not deal with emotions in others. They're, they're emotionally, they have the emotional intelligence of a mosquito. <laughs> and what do you want to do with a mosquito? Well, you know, they, they're, they're too bossy, they're command yeah. and control, yeah. too passive. They let conflicts build, they create toxic environments. Mm. We want leaders, and it's new because of the pandemic, you have to trust. And to trust, you have to be emotionally available and connected. Yeah. Otherwise, you want to over-control. Yep. So we have the bossy leaders, the, conser uh, the, the co coercive the leaders, yeah. and those then are too passive, too affiliative. They're afraid of conflict. Mm -hmm. No, as you and I share in our view, you have to face conflict. You have to engage in conflict if you want to be 
a high-performing leader. And that takes us again into the whole arena of negotiation. Negotiations, emotions, leadership, it all goes together. And when you can combine that right. and not be afraid of one or the other. And it starts by listening. Yeah. Listening to the pain in the other person. What the other person really wants. We have so many leaders who are too focused on themselves. Mm. They're salespersons. Yeah. They want to sell something. Instead of influencing. Mm. Exactly. Well, obviously, we're, we're very much aligned in, in the way we think about negotiation, about leadership. That's why I'm, I'm honored to, to be uh, working with you and learning from you. Um, in the Life Negotiation podcast, I take the whole aspect of negotiations further and say we have to realize that we don't only negotiate with others, but we also negotiate with ourselves and we negotiate with life. Um, what is your take on that? Oh, I'm, we're absolutely in agreement there because in the, in the leadership arena, we talk about leading self, mm -hmm. leading others, leading organizations. So you have to be able to deal with loss internally. Manage your mindset, manage your mind's eye on what you focus on. If you don't know what you want, if you deny the desire or the knowledge of what you really want, it becomes important. And to be able to know how to make a choice. Many people cannot make a choice. So mm. they sort of walk down the aisle of trying to reach two or three goals without ever really leading successfully. So what they have to do is be able to let go of a desire, of a goal, and manage their own internal states. Mm. But mostly emotions, and you're the expert there. <laughs> How do we deal with our own emotions? The amygdala hijack in so many people is triggered. And people walk around with triggers yeah. that get stimulated by all kinds of things. Mm. And they may be very emotional, but they hide it. They may be very emotional and they blow up and they express it mm. inappropriately. So we have to understand how emotions are a central part of leading self. And then you can effectively influence others. I have to hear the emotion in other people. Mm. I have to hear the pain in other people. Yeah, because when, when we block, even though it's through grief or, or, or real pain in our lives, when we block our emotions, we then pretend they don't exist in other people either. And when somebody is going through an emotion and you pretend it doesn't exist, that is like the big, biggest blockage to bonding and to connecting. Um, and, and we see this a lot in the medical world, for example. And I'm trying to make an impact in the medical world where medical doctors who have to give bad news on a regular basis, in order to protect themselves, they create this wall of, I am just here to inform you and I'm not going to be emotional about it. It's extremely rational and factual. So they come in and they say, here you have it. Your child is sick, is dying. Good luck with it. So as a patient or as a parent, you feel zero connection with that doctor, zero bonding. And then on the journey, they come with all these uh, protocols of medicine to, to be taken, which all have long side effects. And you're in your corner going on Google to decide whether you're going to do it or not because you think the doctor doesn't care. I'm just a number. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a large, important work to be done to teach this to medical doctors as well of saying, how can you both protect yourself from the bad news that you have to deliver fine and at the same time connect with your patients? And the grief in patients. And the grief <clears> in see, patients. See, it's two sides of the same coin. The grief in the doctor, the grief in the patient. Mm. So if you're going to be a human being and you're going to emotionally connect, you have to be able to be available to that other person's pain. Compassion means you're able to feel that, but you draw a boundary. Yeah. We had a horrible example of a very talented doctor in the U.S. beginning in the pandemic who just did not take care of herself. She was working with patient after patient 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. getting very little sleep. And she ended up killing herself. Oh, wow. What a sad story. Mm. We had a case here. We had several suicides here in Switzerland. The CEO of Swisscom, who could not handle the changes that was happening in his life, but he didn't express it. Mm. After the pain got so deep, he took a rope and killed himself. Yeah, they don't see any way out. Yeah, because and they, people... had, they had the resources to leave, to just say goodbye to the job. Mm. But they didn't find the mind's eye focus on that. They couldn't deal with 
the loss to their identity. And there was a whole lot more going on. Yes, and what we know from suicide and uh, having done suicide negotiation, we know that nobody wants to die, but they want the suffering to end. Yeah. And if we are not taught how to deal with suffering, how to deal with pain and the emotions yeah. that we feel, then killing ourselves is like yeah. the last mean we have yeah. to stop that pain. Yeah. So we should really be teaching this to leaders. To we should be well, starting in kindergarten, teaching yeah. children how to deal with emotions. Yeah. That becomes a key part of understanding negotiation and hostage negotiation mm -hmm. or negotiation with someone who wants to commit suicide. It's very often the pain is so great they can't deal with it, yeah. so they want to escape. The other is they've lost hope. They mm -hmm. see no future, no hope. They lose a child, they lose a job, they lose their money, they lose their house, they get a divorce. And I think that's the end. And they lose hope. Mm -hmm. So one of the things negotiators do is find honest, authentic ways to build a hope, find a hope, because the goal of life is to come back to the joy of life. And it's always possible, no matter what the loss. No what Coming the loss. back to that difficult conversation, Luzanne, we are now focused on teaching, and I'm working with uh, uh, several companies on large-scale dialogues. How do you talk to people who are screaming at you? Mm. politicians, uh, uh, community members who resist what you're doing. And the big mistake many managers make is they always want to sell the benefit. We're bringing so many jobs into your community. We're doing this. Yeah, we're doing... convincing. And they don't hear the loss of what is happening with the participants in that community or the stakeholders. So how do you sit and hear somebody screaming at you? for as long as 15 minutes or even a half hour and be able to ask a question. For example, mm. what do you really want me to know about what you're saying? And questions calm people down. But first you need to know how to calm yourself yeah, down you have and to be lead able yourself. to yeah. and feel the emotion because obviously you're going to feel annoyed yeah. or frustrated or whatever it yeah. is. And how can we transform then that not becoming a trigger of yeah. how do you dare talking to me like that? and manage your ego, manage your triggers, manage your emotions, and remain calm so that you can connect to the other person and say what really matters here and yeah. how can we go And what you solution. saw this week is what we do in the High Performance Leadership Program and now the Advanced High Performance Leadership Program, which is to help leaders understand these are all learnable skills. Yes, that is it's what talent. gives hope. Everybody can it's learn talent. this. But they have to understand, they have to be eager to learn mm. and be willing to learn. Yes. And as we look at the way negotiation really works, we have to understand bonding. The way leadership works, we have to understand bonding, the need to connect, even with your enemy, even with an adversary. And then to create in that dialogue, the secure base, the trust, and psychological safety, all of these things that the pandemic has pushed to the forefront. I am sure you've heard it. I've heard it so many times at IMD that there are people who don't trust people working at home. Mm, yeah, still. <laughs> well, they're working in their pajamas. How do I know they're not taking extended lunches? Well, it doesn't matter if they get the job, the job done. done. Exactly. Are you bonded? Are you connected? And are mm. you still able to create that team spirit? Yeah. Even when people are only meeting over Zoom mm. or meeting not even regularly on in any basis. But it is evolving. I see, I mean, I've been in business now for 20 years. It is evolving, isn't it? There is hope. Leaders oh. are moving from authority to collaboration. Many, hope, many leaders get it. You, we yeah. saw the transformations of people who were very emotionally unavailable. The bullies. Yeah. The persons who are too aloof, too detached. And some professions particularly attract those. The financial profession I know. often attracts them. <laughs> the engineering profession, the 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 legal lawyers uh, mm. uh, are prone to this. They have to learn that they are dealing with people. Yeah. And the secret of emotional intelligence, as Dan Goldman has so much put out in the front, is to get people connected, and then they're inspired to be highly motivated, highly engaged, and bingo, you get better results. Absolutely, and we saw it this week over and over again. And even the difficult conversations, the yeah. exercises we did with yeah. you and uh, Scott, Scott Tillema, who is amazing at yeah. this. 
the role play and people thinking I could never, never resolve this situation or have this conversation in this way with, with the advice that we gave, we saw people transform in literally what, 10 minutes, Yeah. right? So maybe it's just it's, a lack of tools and the mindset. It's rewiring the brain. And, they have to rewire the brain. Mm. They can't teach themselves. We know yeah. you have to practice. Mm. Erickson said up to 10,000 hours. Well, it can be learned in even faster or sometimes yeah. longer. Practicing correctly and having a secure base. A teacher you trust that you're willing to learn. So, for example, one of the big mistakes people make in negotiation and difficult conversations is they talk too much. Mm. They don't ask enough questions. Okay, so, so let's teach, go to the tips then. Yeah. One of it is... Don't talk too much. Don't or be four precise. sentences or less. Don't okay. over detail. Huh? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need more than four sentences. Yeah. But to be able to focus and say less. What matters, yeah. And be able to ask questions. Asking questions. And put the fish on the table. So if there is a conflict, if there is an issue, what is that issue? Don't sugarcoat it. Mm. Do it with respect. We know how important respect is. Yeah. But honest truthful, putting issues on the table, as we call fish on the table, and then go through the bloody mess of cleaning that fish for the great fish dinner at the end of the day. Now, this is also cultural specific. So those are a couple of the points. Listening, yep. paraphrasing, being able to manage your own emotion and not be controlled by your own fear. Many times people are afraid or they're angry, and that gets in the way of how they're mm. talking. It's so game-changing if we change. If, if, if there's one thing that listeners would take away from it is start listening, truly listening. That's already a massive game-changer. And how do you guarantee you've listened? Right. And you paraphrase it perfectly. I don't mean yeah. near perfectly. Mm. So you ask the person, is this what you've actually said? And if they say yes, boom, boom. it enhances the bonding, yeah. you move forward. If they say no, what didn't I understand? What then? Exactly. And you get more intel. And if you've got somebody who's over-submissive, you actually paraphrase incorrectly. It's a mm. very subtle technique. You say the, to see if they say <laughs> no, correct it. And no's are very important yes. in that whole process. And by the way, this is about culture. You're from the Middle East, so you know the advantage Middle Easterners have. In negotiating, and bonding and because they bond, yep. they don't want to just sit down and say, "Okay, let's go to the bottom line." No, What's your we best take a deal? lot of time. You, you have, and who we are you talk family, with? which we don't really who, do here. And and the, what the Middle Easterners have to learn is how to maybe get a little more direct sooner, mm. but they have the advantage in that. The Asian cultures have the advantage in that they have this idea of saving face. Yeah. It is not true you can't do good conflict management in Asia. And you China. just need to learn that their way of saying no is different. It's different. They're never going to bush it in your face like <laughs> the Dutch or the Germans or the <laughs> Americans do. It's like, boom. Yeah. Uh, but, but then you know. But, but with respect and being able then to learn some of those final, uh, 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 important final skills of asking the right questions. Answering questions. You ask about... The, Many leaders do not answer questions. Somebody asks you something, answer it. Yeah. If you can't answer it, you tell them why. Mm. Okay, so we have listening, asking good questions, caring also about people to want to know what is it that matters to you. Yeah. Emotional intelligence, self-control, to be able to be there, bonding, trust, all those things. And it's exactly the same things that we need to be a good negotiator that we can literally transform in what we need to be good leaders. And, and this whole aspect of being negotiating with ourselves, leading our own lives. How can we connect with others if we're not connected to ourselves anymore? Um, where the importance of personal development comes in again. But I was so proud to see these leaders coming here all over the world, different sectors, um, and, and some ready and some not at all to go and to go deep. But once they did the transformation and how fast, that was so fascinating. It, you don't have to learn for years and years. Their professional life changes and their personal life changes. Yes. Because the old idea there's work and there's personal life and there's a strict yeah. boundary is over. Yeah. The two flow, it's true, you need some boundaries, 
but who you are at home does influence who you are at work. And whether you're Absolutely. unhappy, it influences, yeah. or happy. The one technique that was left out and you mentioned we want to add is concession making. Mm -hmm. So how do you recognize when somebody is making an effort to come towards you? It may be they're just answering a question. Yeah. They're saying something small. You have to reward, like animal trainers do, reward every concession. And yeah. this is often missed in leadership and in negotiation. Absolutely, and that was one of the takeaways for me as well, to systematically recognize and acknowledge when somebody makes a, even a tiny step towards you. And sometimes that can just be by listening, by saying, tell me more. Yeah. That is a concession. That's right? a con yeah. We need to recognize them yeah. and, and, and reward. And also to understand that sugarcoating doesn't work. No. We have so many leaders who try to be too nice, too affiliative. And then they go from affiliative to very coercive, mm. the command yeah, and control. But to be able to not sugarcoat, be able to use words that reach people, influence mm. people. And we also talk about this as coming from the person effect. Who do you, each individual leader, each negotiator, how do you personally connect mm to that other person, positively or negatively. Yeah. You can see how in a second somebody can be triggered by a facial expression, a tone of voice, the way they smile or don't smile, a uh, lack of authenticity. We have to understand this, and Pavlov was the first one to recognize this. He oh, named really? it the person effect. In studying mm -hmm. dogs, yeah. every dog was uh, in, was changing their physiological reactions each time a person walked into the room. He ordered everybody out of the room when they were having the exact measurements. He said, I don't care about that person effect. I want to know the measurements in dogs. So it was follow-up people who did that research. And I was blessed to have one of those, Jim Lynch, who worked with the third generation of uh, Pavlovians to understand how talking and he used this talk, quiet talk phenomenon to deal with blood pressure. And he's the first one to wow. recognize the broken heart syndrome. syndrome. He put it in a book, mm. how the medical consequences yes. of loneliness occur. Well, we have to understand how we trigger other people, positively and negatively. And negatively. Amazing. <laughs> George, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours. Uh, obviously, we're aligned on a lot of things, and I learned so much from you. Um, I could uh, recommend anybody to, if they have the opportunity to learn from you, to do it. Uh, there are your books here that um, I, I, I will share it in the, in the comments, Hostage at the Table, uh, where you share your insights, Care to Dare, um, where it all comes together. I want to thank you so much. And as a final question, you've written and you've shared your work in your books. You've done all these trainings. You've impacted what tens of thousands of leaders already um, and you keep going right you have so much experience and you keep going and you keep giving what is the legacy that you would like to leave behind and I'm not talking about your work and your methods but as a person how would you George like to be remembered well first of all I'm a product of the legacy of many people uh, Carl Rogers mm. Uh, Jim Collins, uh, Warren Bennis. I could go through a whole list. So I want to do a similar kind of thing. Be able to have people become better parents, better leaders, better people to experience the true joy of life. I see so often people who lose that desire for adventure. They lose their curiosity. So I want to help with those transformations. And I want people to use that, those ideas to teach others, to be models, to be secure bases, to help people be able to negotiate better, lead better, deal with their children in a different way, their spouses and partners, live life in a way with an emotional availability. We see so many people deny risk-taking. They back away from ventures. Life needs to be an adventure. And when you reach an adventure, say goodbye to it and find a new dream, find a new adventure. <laughs> and I want to just be a part of creating that philosophy. 
Well, you have and you are. Well, I mean, thank we you. can't work with you and not be transformed. Thank you very um, much. Thank you and so much. And the other thing that I'm wanting to do through that is to create this legacy through Coal Reserve Leadership Institute, KLI, where I'm working with my son in setting up a whole process for youth leadership, mm. for people who've reached uh, retirement. Yeah, retirement and, and, and or they're downsized. How do they find a new adventure in leadership or many other areas to go to retreats, to learn emotional availability, things that cannot be done through IMD or any business school can be done in these uh, other ways. And uh, I really look forward to that. And I'm inspired by people who make these profound changes. Thank you so much. I will share all the information where people can find you or reach out Thank to you. your companies um, around the podcast and, and, and under on the YouTube page. Again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm speechless by the quality of work that you do and, and the impact that that has and how fast it happens. Again, I said, I said it several times. Um, so I would like to thank you again. Well, uh, thank Professor you. It's George been a pleasure Corizer. to talk to you. The only problem is it's too short. <laughs> it's always too short. But I've enjoyed it. Right? We've made the best out of what time we yeah, have. Yeah, we spent one week together. <laughs> so that was already fantastic. And now this, this hour together. Thank you so much. And thank um, you for bringing all these ideas to a broad world of people who cannot come to workshops or seminars or business schools, but they can learn through you. Well, I'm doing my best to share this in the podcast and on social media to spread the word and impact people as, as best, as good as we can. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, it's an honor. And for the listeners at home, I would like to say thank you so much for listening to this episode. Um, I am completely energized by this conversation. I hope you had many great insights as well. And see you next time at Life Negotiation with another yet fascinating professional negotiator. Thank you.